Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, my microphone seems to work just fine. I'm usually teaching in a, a smaller room. I think the room capacity in the room I usually teach in is 60. So this is a, a lot of fun to be speaking to so many more people. So, so thanks for coming out tonight. So uh, timid predators, scary prey. Why wolves are wimpier than you think? And let me just ask, how many people have a little bit of a fear of wolves? Who thinks wolves are scary? Raise your hands up so I can see them. Real wolves. Are real wolves scary? What do you guys think? Come on, raise your hand so I can see them. OK, so then what we're going to do at the end of my talk is we're going to, I'm going to ask that same question. And I'm going to see if there's just as many hands, maybe more, hopefully less. That's what I'm aiming for, is fewer hands at the end of my talk. So how many people knew this? that wolves are controversial and polarizing. Who knew that? And maybe that's why some of you came, because it's sort of an exciting topic, because there's a lot of divergent views about the value of wolves, whether we need them or not. Um, and this is really kind of a big motivation for the lo a lot of the work that I do, sort of addressing this polarization with facts, with science, and trying to separate uh, myth from reality. And so why are these views on wolves so polarizing? And there's a lot of answers to these questions, or to that question. Um, but what I would argue, and the argument that I'm going to make tonight, is that it, a lot of it stems from a common misunderstanding about what wolves actually do in the environment, how they actually behave. One of the things that uh, people often don't realize is that up until the time wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone, um, most of the wolves that had been studied had been studied in remote places that were hard to get to, that they were often forested, which meant that we didn't see the wolves. Uh, we might have been snow tracking them, watching them from aircraft, putting radio collars on them. But actual direct observations of wolves in the wild were really rare up until about 20 years ago, up until the time wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone. There are some exceptions to that, say like up in the, up in the high Arctic, but not, there wasn't a lot of work done on, on the behavior of wolves in the wild because they're so hard to, to study in the wild in terms of direct observation. And so a lot of the misunderstanding about wolves comes from the fact that they just haven't been watched directly in the environment. Uh, and Yellowstone has provided us that opportunity, and I'll present some of that information today. So the reason why I think wolves are misunderstood is because, or why there's so much polarization is because there, there's this common misunderstanding. And on one side, you have people that sort of demonize wolves, and sort of an old story. A lot of us have probably heard of this story before, wolves being sort of the, the super villain. Okay, the ecological bad guy. And it stems from a view that, that wolves, you know, they have this terrible impact on prey populations. They, they drive down prey numbers, elk, deer, moose, what have you. Um, and that's, that's really the motivating concern for people who, who think wolves are, are really problems. And then, of course, there's also the issue of wolves preying on livestock. And that's an old view. Uh, for the most part. That's been around for as long as, as wolves have been around, really. More recently is this view. <laughs> that, I like it that you guys laugh and have a sense of humor. Um, and, and this is an interesting view. Um, it's a more recent view, and it's, it's based on the idea that wolves have a, a role to play in the environment that's actually valuable, uh, despite what this side may think that, you know, wolves have an important role to play. And, and that role has really been the focus of a lot of work in Yellowstone. And this, this cartoon sort of sums it up. This is sort of an artist's uh, conception of what Yellowstone looked like before the wolf reintroduction. And if I could just point out a few things. So there were a lot of elk. Um, back here we have our aspen forest. Notice there isn't very many young aspen 
All we have are old aspen. And so the idea is that the elk were grazing down or browsing down all the aspen. And so that was le leading to decline in, in aspen. The stream banks were trampled. We had a, a, maybe an overabundance of coyotes because wolves are competitors with coyotes. And um, it's thought that wolves drive down coyote numbers. And so this is sort of the, uh, the Yellowstone out of balance cartoon that some of you may be familiar with. And then after Wolf Reintroduction, we have sort of this picture that's been presented. And this is a, a common story that you'll see uh, in popular media, like National Geographic. You'll see it in textbooks, uh, in ecology, in environmental science. And the idea here is that wolves, by killing elk or by scaring elk, uh, have had beneficial effects on the environment. They, they've, they've reduced. Uh, stream bank browsing by the elk, and that's led to a profusion of willow along the stream banks. Notice we've got some recruitment, some young aspen uh, growing up in the understory. Um, we also have some interesting other sort of figures that are jumping out. We have a grizzly bear now that's peeking out. We've got, um, there's a green winged teal that somehow wolves are having an effect on, I guess, through their influence on the, on the riparian vegetation. and. The wolves changing rivers in that story. And so it's this sort of idea that is motivating the, the notion of wolves as sort of ecological superheroes. And so this is kind of a new idea, really, that, that wolves have relatively new in terms of being super popular. I mean, it, the idea really got started in the 40s with Aldo Leopold, and he was the first one to really articulate in the scientific literature the value of predators. But it wasn't really until wolves got restored into Yellowstone that this idea really took off. So we have the, the wolf as a supervillain, and then we have the wolf as a superhero, these two sort of polarizing ideas. And what, what that really has led to is this perception uh, on both sides, interestingly enough, that wolves are these sort of these super predators. That's what's so interesting about this polarizing or, or polarized idea about wolves and whether they're good or bad. It stems from sort of this common idea that wolves are these terrifically efficient, uh, high-performing predators, and that every time they chase down an elk, they kill it. And that as a result, the elk are terrified every time they see a wolf, or they smell a wolf, or they hear a wolf howl. The elk freak out, and they run away from the aspen. They run away from the stream banks, that sort of thing. So that's what's so interesting about this, in my, my view, is that both of these ideas of wolves as superhero and supervillain stem from this perception of wolves as being super predators. And this idea of wolves being super predators is reinforced by a lot of the mythology in our culture about wolves. So uh, three little pigs and, and the wolf here blowing down their house. So wolves are super powerful. They can blow down houses. Uh, of course, we have Little Red Riding Hood. Um, and these may be ancient or old ideas, uh, but you know, those ideas live on in popular media. And this is just one recent example. This is a movie called The Gray with Liam Neeson. I think this uh, came out in 2008 or so. Two, no, no, 2011 or 12, soon after I arrived here in Logan. And uh, it's about this uh, group of uh, miners who's playing crashes in the Arctic. Uh, and there's wolves all over, and, and the whole idea is the wolves chase these miners down and, and, and eat every last one of them, except for Liam Neeson. <laughs> and, uh, and, and sort of the, the climate, climactic sort of uh, scene in the film is when he confronts the lead wolf, the alpha wolf, alpha male, and he, and he, and he takes a bunch of uh, these little you know, sort of alcohol bottles, I guess, from the bar on the plane that crashed, and he broke them, and he taped them onto his fingers, so now he had claws. And so that's how he was going to defend himself against the wolf. And I actually had people, uh, journalists from various media outlets, contacting me and asking me if this would actually work. <laughs> like, could you really defend yourself against a wolf by taping broken glass to your fingers? It, never mind the question of, would you really be attacked by a wolf? It's whether this would actually be a viable defense <laughs> against a wolf. And so, it, you know, I mean, that, this, is, this is funny, but it's also a little sad because despite all the progress we've made in terms of learning about wolves, 
in the last several decades, there's still some just fundamental uh, misconceptions, and it's really hard to resist the temptation to demonize wolves. There's something about wolves that it's just difficult for, for the media and for others to avoid demonizing them. Um, so anyway, so some of our, our perceptions about wolves as being super predators is, is motivated uh, by some of those cultural myths. But the fact is that wolves are actually mediocre predators. I mean, that's what all the scientific information says, uh, is that they're on average only about 10, successful about 10% of the time. So one out of 10 times that they try to take down an elk, they actually get driven off or the elk run away uh, scot-free, okay? So not the 100% of the time, but 10% but of the time. And so what I want to spend some time talking about then tonight is why are wolves mediocre predators? And the reason why I think this is an important question to talk with you about is because by understanding what wolves can't do, what they cannot do, it, that will help sort of bridge the divide between these two sort of polarized views because oftentimes the, the folks that are talking about the vices of wolves or the virtues of wolves, they, they rarely start their conversation or their argument by saying what wolves cannot do. It's always about what they can do. They can eliminate the elk population or they can bring back the aspen or they can reduce coyote numbers. But there's very little discussion about what wolves cannot do and that's where I think we need to spend some time. Why is it that they cannot capture an elk every time they want? What's the reason for that? It's an important question to ask because if you, if you ask that question, if you answer that question, uh, you can help really understand what's going on in reality and, and sort of separating that, uh, the, the myth from, uh, from the facts. Okay, so interesting. There are many, many limits on the ability of wolves to hunt. And who here has a dog? Who here has a dog? Okay. So a lot of you probably already know this just by observing how your dog interacts with other dogs, with you, with other animals. And all you really need to do to start looking into the limits of wolf hunting behavior is just open up uh, an anatomy textbook. Look at the skeletal features of wolves. And so here's just a sketch. And I'm going to spend some time talking uh, about the skull of wolves. And I've got a bunch of skulls up here of wolves and some other animals uh, for comparison. And understanding the behavior of wolves really starts with the skeleton, OK? And specifically, the teeth. And so these are the incisors, right? And these are the canines. We all have those. And that's what wolves primarily use to grab their prey. That's the only thing they grab their prey with are the incisors. And their, and their canines, okay? Those are the, the primary weapons that wolves have. And what's important about the operation of those tools is, is the movement of the jaw, or this is called the mandible, and the muscles that are used uh, to, that attach to the mandible, that's what creates the force, the power of the bite is, is, is uh, operated by those muscles there. And what's really important to, to understand is that the length, the distance between where the bite is and that uh, um, joint right there, that has a large effect on the power of the bite. The longer that distance, the, the less the power of the bite, okay? And the shorter that distance, the more powerful the bite, all right? And just to demonstrate that, I've got my handy yard clippers. And uh, I've always wanted to do this in front of a group, so let's give it a try. So let's pretend this is my, my wolf. OK, these are my jaws. Here's my jaw joint right there, OK? And so I, in my hands are those jaw muscles, and I'm, and I'm pressing on that. And I actually, I'm pressing pretty hard, and I can't actually snap that PVC pipe, OK? Because I just can't. Ex that pressure that's just too far out there on the teeth, okay? So it's not a very powerful bite. Now, if I take my other clippers, okay, and I get that in there. Let's see if that works. Oh, perfect. 
Okay, so the distance between where those incisors are and the joint have a big effect on the power of the bite. Okay, so a wolf skull is a bit like these. Okay, so here's the wolf skull here, and for a comparison, we've got our cougar over here. Okay. And notice that a cougar, the distance between those uh, canine tips and the jaw joint is a lot less. And so afterwards, you guys can come down here and take a look at these two skulls. This, this is actually a, a, a replica, this one here. This is a wolf. This is a, a, a mountain lion or a cougar, and that's a, that's a real skull here. So I'd, I'd ask you actually not to touch this because this is a research specimen. But you can see the difference in the, the length be the, be in the distance between the, the tips of the teeth and the jaw joint, okay? Now there's other parts of this puzzle that we want to focus on. It's the actual jaw joint itself. What do you notice there? What you should notice is that there are these little processes around the cougar joint, okay? Whereas it's, it's rather open for, for the wolf, okay? <clears throat> So what, this, what that means is that this, this just opens up really quite easily, okay? Um, it's not heavily stabilized, okay? With the, with the cougar, on the other hand, it's more stabilized. It's gonna fall out a little bit if I drop it, but you can see it kinda hangs in there. And so another animal that has a very stabilized jaw joint is the wolverine. And I can just let it hang right there like that, okay? So it had, those little processes are really well developed. And the reason why that's important is because when a, one of these carnivores puts a bite on an animal, that animal is twisting and trying to get away, okay? And if, if the carnivore can't stabilize the bite, can't, can't lock down, that animal's gone. It gets away, okay? So we hear often about the cougar having a, a really effective killing bite. Okay, and that's partly because of the short skull and then also because of that reinforced joint. The wolf, on the other hand, does not have those features and so that's why the wolf doesn't have as strong of a bite as a cougar, okay? And that's part of the reason why prey often escape. Frequently you see wolves grabbing a hold of an elk or a deer or a bison and, and they're you know, wrestling with it and it gets away. That happens frequently, particularly with bison in part two because bison have a very tough hide. So that long snout and then the open jaw joint leads to a relatively weak bite for the wolf, okay? Wolves don't have claws. Uh, excuse me, they don't have retractable claws, sharp retractable claws. And cougars do, and so if you look at these, these tracks here that I have up here, this is a, a track of a Yellowstone wolf, you'll see those claws stick out really clearly. On the mountain lion, um, they're up here, and they, they register a pie on the, on the track because they're uh, retracted, okay? And this is also a Yellowstone lion. Um, and so those claws are important for cougars for restraining the prey. But even if wolves did have sharp, retractable claws, it wouldn't do them any good. Does anyone know why? Why wouldn't it do wolves any good, if they, even if they had retractable claws? You know what they can't do? They can't, hold on. they can't rotate their elbows. Yeah, all dogs can do is this, right? They're just and bite, okay? So they've got these long legs. They can't rotate their elbows. Also, they're not very muscular, okay? Cougars, on the other hand, very muscular forelimbs. And here's just a, a sort of cutaway of the a foreleg of a, of a dog and just showing the elbow and, the, and just highlighting the fact that they can't rotate that elbow. And the reason why that's important is because it means that they cannot grapple their prey. This is an African lion taking down a Cape buffalo. Wolves can't do that. So, so really what that means is that this is th those teeth are really their only weapons. Those incisors and those canines are their, their only weapons. And that fact also contributes to the reason why wolves are mediocre predators, okay? Now, so we've talked about the skeletal attributes, which is anybody with, a, like I said, with an anatomy textbook 
uh, could figure this out just by comparing wolves with other carnivores as I did. But what about these other traits, behavioral traits, age, weight? How do we know about the effects those have on uh, the ability of wolves to hunt? We know something about them because, as I mentioned at the beginning, we can watch wolves hunt in Yellowstone, and we watch it frequently, particularly in the early years when there were a lot of elk. Okay? This was something that you could observe uh, routinely in places like Lamar Valley, uh, Slough Creek, uh, Hell Roaring Slope. And so we would use our spotting scopes, and we would observe and we would record what we would see, uh, how many wolves were in the group. And then not only were we actually seeing this firsthand, but super importantly, we actually knew the identities of the individual wolves that were in the group. Oftentimes, most of the individuals. Sometimes they were radio collared, sometimes they weren't. Uh, if they were radio collared, it gave us information about their age, uh, and then that in combination with their gender gave us information about their weight. We could estimate their weight based on their gender and their age at any given point in their lifetime. So we had just tremendous insight into the role of individual traits on their ability to hunt. Just like we might want to have no information about uh, the age, how age influences your ability to perform athletically. You know, what we all know that Michael Jordan isn't playing basketball anymore because he's not 20 years old. It's the same idea with wolves and other large predators. These traits have a big influence on their ability to hunt. So one of the common uh, myths about wolves is that they're highly cooperative hunters. They work together in groups. I bet most people probably have heard of this. But our observations in Yellowstone uh, suggest that at least when they're hunting elk, that's not the case. And so this is looking at the probability that a group of wolves makes the transition from chasing down elk to actually grabbing a hold of it. And what you can see is that, yes, there is an initial increase in the probability of making that transition as you go from uh, one to four hunters. But then after that, it just sort of peters out. There's no further increase in hunting success with each additional wolf in the group. And the reason why is because after four wolves, individual wolves begin to start to hold back because it's dangerous to grab a hold of one of these animals. You get kicked, you get uh, hit by an antler. It's a dangerous prospect. So they're better off withholding that effort because that little bit of extra effort that they might invest isn't going to raise the odds of success sufficiently to offset those risks of participation. So that's why you don't see continued increases in hunting success with group size when they're hunting with elk. But, but the picture is a little bit different when you're looking at interactions between wolves and bison. You'll actually see continued increases in uh, probability of capture with group size up until about 11 wolves. And so uh, when they're hunting elk, these guys out here that, that appear to be contributing to the hunt, they're not. They're just tagging along to be there when these four or two or three actually make the kill. These younger ones, uh, and sometimes they're not younger, sometimes they're older, sometimes they're the parents. And I think some of us probably can appreciate that. We're going to let the kids take the risks, make the effort, take down the elk, and then mom and dad you know, come along and, and feed alongside them. So this could be mom and dad, or it could be the kids. The point is, they're not really contributing, okay? They're just going to be there when the meal is made available to them. But like I said, with the bison, it's a little bit different. Wolves are slightly more cooperative, uh, and by that I mean uh, each additional wolf increases hunting success up until about 11 wolves, and then after that it begins to, to uh, taper off. There's no further increase beyond 11 wolves. Um, and so if you're living with, with bison and you're a wolf, it helps to be in a big group uh, for killing bison. And I also mentioned the role of age, individual age. So we'll have, uh, on, a, like on average, or the, the median, say, uh, lifespan of a wolf is about six years of age. And so what I mean by that is that about half of, the, of wolves are dead before they reach six years of age and then half wolves, the other half continue on beyond six to a maximum of about 12 or 13. Not unlike a domestic dog, actually. Uh, pretty similar. And so what we see in terms of hunting ability, the probability of making that transition from attacking 
to grabbing a hold of the animal, it actually peaks pretty early, about between two and three years of age. Those are the Michael Jordans of the wolf world, those two to three year olds, okay? You get beyond that, and then your hunting ability begins to decline. And so these older animals are the ones that are oftentimes hanging back. They're not doing much. They're not contributing. These are the two, two and three-year-olds out, out in front. Size also matters. And it, it should be fairly obvious why. Because if all you have are your canines and your incisors to grab a hold of that prey animal, the only way to get that animal to the ground is just by sheer weight and just pulling it down. So the heavier you, heavier you are, the more likely you're able to pull that animal down. And so you can see the probability of capturing increases with an individual's weight. So all of these traits, skeletal, behavioral, age, and weight, they all limit the ability of wolves to perform uh, these, these different hunting behaviors, to, to capture and to kill. And the reason why these traits are important in terms of from an ecological standpoint is because it dictates which prey the wolves kill and which ones they avoid, okay? If, you, if they have these limitations, that means they can't go after just about anybody they want. They have to be very selective in which prey animals they actually target. So for example, uh, in northern Yellowstone where we have a lot of bison now than we did 20 years ago, uh, bison are extremely difficult for wolves to kill, and so they largely avoid them. They, they've been attacking bison more frequently now than they have 20 years ago, but nowhere near, uh, you know, it's not proportionate to the actual abundance of bison. They're still, they still prefer elk by a long shot. So just uh, in terms of success rates, success rates on, on elk, I told you, is about 10%. With bison, it's, you know, between 1% and 5%, depending on the age of the animal. And group size has a big effect on hunting success in terms of prey group size. Bigger bison herds, bigger elk herds reduce the odds of success for wolves, okay? So you'll see big herds of prey out there, and it's really hard for wolves to actually penetrate those herds and get after an individual. So they have to be very selective in who they, they target. And these data here show the age distribution of 620-odd uh, elk that wolves killed uh, uh, before, between the time they were reintroduced in about 2005. And of those 620 or so elk, most of them were elk calves. So these were animals that were less than 12 months of age. And then elk that were older than 10 years of age. These animals in between, the yearlings and these adults, rarely were killed by elk or by wolves. And this pattern has not changed in the 20 years we've had wolves in Yellowstone. And this pattern is not unique to Yellowstone. You'll see that pattern, whether it's wolves hunting uh, moose on Isle Royal, or bison up in Wood Buffalo National Park in northern Canada, or muskox up on Ellesmere Island in the High Arctic. Wolves are consistently selective hunters because of those limit, limits on their ability to kill, okay? Those limitations are also not unique to Yellowstone. All wolves suffer essentially from those same constraints on their hunting ability. And this is important for understanding the impact of wolves on the, the number of prey in a particular population, in this case, elk. And the reason why is because uh, these younger animals and these old ones, they make up actually a, a, a small number of the total number of elk, in this case, that are out there. Most of the elk that are in the elk population are these yearlings and two to nine year olds, okay? So, so most of the, the pressure that wolves exert on the prey population are exerted to, through these uh, fairly rare age classes, the calves and the older animals. And that's important because it's these adult animals here that are contributing most in terms of uh, reproduction. Those are obviously really important too. And because if, the, if you don't have calves surviving, your population is going to decrease. And so to the extent that wolves are having effects on elk uh, numbers, it's largely through their effects on calf survival. But there are a lot of other reasons why calves may not survive uh, to become one year of age, and that could be because of other predators, 
like mountain lions, for example, are huge predators of elk calves in northern Yellowstone and, and elsewhere. So these guys here. And then also, does anyone know what this is? What is it? What's this? Grizzly bear. So these guys are vacuum cleaners when it comes to elk calves in the summertime. Um, there was a study that was done in the early 2000s. They uh, radio collared something like you know, 100 elk calves. And most of them were dead by August. And most of those that died were because grizzly bears ate them. Okay? And so grizzly bears are huge consumers of elk calves. And then where wolves come into play, actually, is during the winter when bears are in hibernation. And so wolves have an effect on the overwinter survival of elk calves. But other, there could be other sources of mortality, like cougars, and then also winter conditions can have an effect on uh, elk survival as well. But by and large, there's a large number of elk that are, or any, uh, in any prey population, there's a large number of individuals that are simply immune to wolf predation by virtue of their age. Okay? They're just, they're too, you know, they're too young or they're in that sort of prime age category, um, that wolves just simply have too much difficulty bringing them down. They're too dangerous for wolves to attack and kill successfully. So wolves just steer clear of them. And in fact, sometimes the wolves that you do see go after them are the young ones that are, that are inexperienced. And it only takes them to, uh, sort of getting hit in the head once or twice to learn that perhaps they shouldn't go after one of these uh, prime age cows here. OK, so just some, some take home messages. Uh, that I want you all to memorize. And you'll be tested on this tomorrow. No. So the biology of wolves, the biology of wolves, their own biology. So when you think about wolves and you think about the impacts wolves have on the environment, the first thing you need to think about is the biology of the wolf. And, and for some reason, people kind of overlook that. They think about ecosystems and trophic cascades and all these things. But think about the biology of the wolf because the biology fundamentally limits the performance of the wolf and its impact on the environment and other organisms in the environment. So the capacity of wolves then to cause all these interesting ecological changes is really limited by those biological constraints, okay? both in terms of their effects on prey, on prey numbers as well as prey behavior. And that scientists, non-scientists, general public, policymakers, we all really need to avoid that temptation to sort of exaggerate the power of wolves and, and sort of put aside the myths and the movies that we see about wolves and just remind ourselves what wolves are, what they can and what they cannot do, and, and really start by recognizing what they cannot do and, and what it is, what are the reasons for, for why they can't do that. And then finally, I'll just end on, on this note. When you're reading about wolves in the media, uh, even if it's you know, by, by, one of the, you know, by someone who's, who's an expert, perhaps in wolves or in wildlife, um, or, or maybe it's a, uh, a policymaker, or maybe it's someone who represents a nonprofit group, ask yourself whether they're talking about real wolves, OK? talking about imaginary wolves, okay? That's really, it's, it sounds silly, but that's an important question to ask yourself because oftentimes people get these two confused. And this is from the movie The Grey, by the way. This, whoops, this is one of those uh, imaginary wolves that they used. But frequently people, when they're talking about wolves and they're getting very animated about wolves, they're oftentimes not talking about the real thing. They're talking about this imaginary one, okay? And so it just, Keep that in mind as you're digesting all the media out there that has, that's about wolves. Okay, so that's all I have for you. So thank you very much. And so I left plenty of time for questions because often that's sort of the most interesting part of these talks is getting questions from the audience. Yes. There aren't, uh, currently there are not any existing reintroduction efforts where people are actually trying to release wolves into an area where they don't currently uh, exist. At least, uh, 
not in the western United States. There are plans to augment the wolf population on Isle Royal National Park. That, that's still in the planning phases because uh, wolf numbers there have declined dramatically to the point where there's genetic inbreeding and, and there's concern that without wolves, the, the moose population will erupt and create damage ecologically on plants. There's also discussion uh, by some about uh, reintroducing wolves to, to Colorado. Um, that's, that hasn't even really gotten in any sort of formal stage. That's just people talking, um, various groups. And then, of course, I mean, you do have the, the, the effort in, with the Mexican wolves. And there, I, I suppose you could sort of characterize that as an ongoing re reintroduction in the sense that they're aug they continue to augment the population from captive uh, colonies. Uh, but that seems to ebb and flow depending on the, on the politics. And at this point, actually, I'm not totally clear on where that stands, whether they're still augmenting uh, those wolves or not. Uh, there's a lot of uh, debate about Mexican wolves down the southwest. Yes. So you know how you said that the heavier the wolf is, the easier it is for it to take down like an elk? Yes. Did that ever start to taper off? Right? Yes, it does. Thank you for asking that great question. So let me just show you, let me go back here, show this picture. Remember, in this, um, here, okay. Yes, the question was, is, is there ever a disadvantage to being too big as a wolf when it comes to hunting uh, prey? Like, you know, might it slow you down is the question. And the answer is yes, it will slow you down. And so at this stage of the hunt, uh, you can see that they're, you can kind of infer a little that they're, they're running at a fairly high rate of speed. And so what's happening here is that there's, there's several phases of the hunt, okay? They start by simply just approaching uh, a group of elk, say, at a, at a walk or a, a slow trot, and then it picks up a little bit. The prey will run, and frequently with, with wolf-elk interactions, the elk don't just necessarily run in a straight line, particularly if it's a large herd. What will happen instead is, if it's a large herd, they'll, they'll splinter off into subgroups. And so you have sort of chaos. You have elk kind of moving in every which direction. And wolves are scanning through the herd, looking for an individual to select based on uh, its traits. Uh, we think that wolves are probably using their olfactory sense, in part, to identify vulnerable individuals. But because elk that are sick will actually smell. And I think we've probably heard about the ability of domestic dogs to do all kinds of wondrous things when it comes to identifying whether their owner is going to have a seizure ahead of time, or they can even dogs can even sniff out uh, skin cancer on people. And so those are domestic dogs we're talking about. And so if dogs, domestic dogs, can do that, we can only imagine what wolves can do. It's hard to measure, so we don't know for sure. But what we also have seen, though, is that when elk have visible um, disabilities or limps. Uh, wolves will target those animals. So they're, they're using visual cues as well. Uh, asymmetries in the gait. So w when elk are running, they have a very symmetrical gait. But if they have a limp, a bad leg, they'll, they'll have an asymmetrical gait. It will look odd for some reason, and wolves will pick up on that. And when they do pick up on that, their speed will increase because that elk knows it's been targeted and it will run flat out as fast as it, as it can if it's a vulnerable elk. Okay, and that's when the speed really increases. And what we find is that the bigger the wolf, the less likely they're able to make that transition from that simple galloping to sprinting after an individual. And uh, the, the, the smaller wolves excel at that stage of the hunt. And those smaller wolves oftentimes are the females. Females tend to be smaller than males on average, and they tend to excel at that task. Um, on the other hand, if that elk is not vulnerable and it has been targeted, often, it's not uncommon for that elk simply to turn around and confront the wolf that's chasing it and just run it off. So that off also uh, happens as well. So that's an, an excellent question. Let me get over here. Let me ask you guys. Yeah, so if you have a shorter jaw, 
like a mountain lion. Um, or if you look at like a saber-toothed cat, they've got these really short, short snouts, and that really helps them uh, put pressure on the animal that they're biting. The longer that snout, the less pressure they can exert. Yep. So I get the piece, which is um, we shouldn't be afraid of wolves of killing us. And I get the piece, which is wolves inevitably decimating the elk herds of Yellowstone. That's silly. But you know, the other piece of the elk, the, or the wolf debate in the West, rightly or wrongly, is the argument that wolves have the potential to decimate the livestock industry. And so I just wondered if you could spend a little bit of time giving us a few facts or a little bit of a perspective so when we carry that conversation forward, I just want to be a little bit better informed on that. So there's no doubt that wolves are um, potentially important management concerns for livestock producers, no doubt about it. And, and the pattern appears to be that it is certain producers in certain areas that bear the burden of the impact of wolves. So the impact of wolves isn't uniformly distributed across the landscape. It just, you know, a certain producer is going to have his or her cows in a certain pasture that happens to be also where wolves are. And so that producer is going to get hit hard. Other producers they're not going to be hit hard at all. So one thing to just realize is that the impact of wolves on livestock is not uniformly distributed. It's not a uniformly distributed problem in the Western United States. The other thing to recognize, but that's not to say that it's not an acute problem for those producers that bear that impact. It is. And their concerns are, are totally valid and need to be addressed. And people are working hard on trying to minimize those impacts with various lethal and non-lethal methods. Uh, lethal would be just going in and killing the wolves, shooting them, trapping them, and removing them. That works. Then there's also non-lethal techniques, range riders, uh, people on horseback that basically uh, intimidate the wolves and keep them out of the cows. That's, that can be an effective technique in places. Um, managing your herd to reduce overlap with the wolves seasonally. So if you have a pasture that has a wolf den in there, don't graze your, your cows until the wolves leave that area, which they will eventually. So there are techniques to get around it, but those techniques are costly, they have expenses, so, and they have to be dealt with for those producers that have to deal with that problem. Um, but it's also important to keep this in perspective. Uh, you know, one of the major sources of mortality uh, for livestock, and I'm talking cows, and, and I guess sheep as well, are poisonous plants, you know, far in excess of what wolves do. Uh, weather, mat or way in excess of what, what wolves do. Um, so, so wolves are important, they are, they, they are a important predator of livestock in certain cases, and, and we need to focus on that. But we don't need to um, exaggerate that effect, just like we don't need to exaggerate their effect on wild prey. So is that helpful? OK. So we should probably make this the last formal question in here. I think, well, let me do another kid question, if you don't mind. So wait a minute, I, I got you guys. Who, where's a kid that hasn't asked a question yet? Where, 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 where? Oh yeah, with the striped shirt. Oh yeah, ask me your question. So, I wonder why is it that when wolves are Why they have a Oh boy, I didn't get that whole question. So, why what? Why is it that when wolves um go to the Sorry, why do they have a better chance of attacking humans? Why do they have a better chance of attacking humans? So Oh, 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 because they, so, I'm sorry. So the question is, why is it that wolves are more prone to attacking people after they've become accustomed to eating human food? And that is because they associate the people with a handout. And so they lose their fear of people. If they can obtain 
food from, say, someone's backyard or like a carcass dump or something like that, and there are humans in the area, they just grow accustomed to the people. The people are no threat to them, and they're associating the food with the people. And so when they see a person walking in, in through a field, they don't run away. Um, and so that creates the possibility and the potential opportunity for wolves to actually attack a human rather than avoid them. Does that make sense? Okay. okay so Thank you. You're welcome.